Please be seated. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Recognize the Honorable Minister responsible for finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <coughs> Madam Speaker, I rise to offer my support to the motion brought by the fifth elected member for the District of Georgetown. Madam Speaker, this motion seeks to address a major area of concern uh, that is improving the employability of Caymanians. The reality of today's Cayman economy is that it requires appropriately skilled and educated workers. And any government of these islands, Madam Speaker, has a clear and strong mandate to do whatever is possible to empower, enable, promote, and protect, Madam Speaker, the interests of Caymanians. Caymanians have a legitimate expectation, Madam Speaker, that any government will provide its people with the opportunity to provide for themselves and their families, and in so doing, Madam Speaker, to maintain their dignity as respectable citizens of this country. Over the last four decades, the Cayman Islands have transformed itself from a, or has transformed itself from a meagre subsistence type economy into a vibrant, globally competitive, service-based economy, which has allowed many of our people to earn a decent living, to own their own homes, create and own their own businesses, educate themselves and their children, and in general to enjoy a higher standard of living than their forefathers did. Despite these successes, Madam Speaker, there have been many Caymanians who have been left behind. And they ask the question, and it is an often, it's a question that's often heard, who are we developing for? Madam Speaker, Caymanians must be given the opportunity to become active participants in our, economy, in our economic success. And I will argue, Madam Speaker, should have the first priority when it comes to employment opportunities in these islands if they are qualified for the job. In its 2013 Labor Force Survey report, the Economics and Statistics Office reported that the labor, force, the labor force of the Cayman Islands consisted of some 38,483 persons, of which some 50.1%, or 19,317 persons, were Caymanian, and 49.9%, or 19,165 persons, were non-Caymanians. Amongst the Caymanian portion of the workforce, some 1,807 1, persons were reported as being unemployed. Truthfully, Madam Speaker, there is no quick and easy fix to improving the employment situation for Caymanians. It requires a concerted effort on the part of the government, employers, and the Caymanians themselves, Madam Speaker. It is the responsibility of the government to remove as many obstacles as possible and create a positive environment which encourages our people to obtain the skills required by the employer. In addition, the government, the government must hold employers accountable for adherence to strict standards of creating a Caymanian first workforce. Rewarding those employers who have demonstrated compliance in this area and reprimanding non-compliant employers. Nevertheless, individuals need to step up and take responsibility 
for their own level of, for their own personal development and actively seek to acquire the level of education and skills necessary to keep themselves employable. There are many job opportunities, Madam Speaker, available in, Cam in Cayman. So we have to make sure that Caymanians are prepared to take advantage of those job opportunities. Madam Speaker, because of the Im importation of labor, the government derives significant amounts of revenue from, <coughs> from work permit fees. They are a major source, major revenue source for the government, Madam Speaker. And with respect to the 2014-2015 budget, we have forecasted the receipt of some 73.5 million from the various categories of work permit fees. However, Madam Speaker, over the long term, we cannot grow overly reliant on this revenue stream and must work to find a balance where these fees are used to train and upskill Caymanians to take on positions held by foreigners. And Madam Speaker, in this day and age, every little word is picked upon. And words that are used innocently are taken out of context and used disproportionately for whatever reason. So, Madam Speaker, in this context, the word foreigner simply means non caymanian From a financial perspective, Madam Speaker, 10% of work permit fees would account to equate to approximately $7.35 million, which is a significant amount by any standards. In establishing a segregated fund, we have to ensure that these funds are managed prudently and not to seek to fund activities and programs which would simply increase government expenditure in an unintended manner, creating even further unintended consequences. Now, Mr. Speaker, the concept of linking financial assistance to requirement for further education or training fits clearly within the government's policy objectives. The Needs Assessment Unit of the Department of Children and Family Services has reported that during the 2013-2014 fiscal year, it provided approximately 9.9 .9 million CI dollars in direct financial assistance to some 2,493 families. Madam Speaker, for persons who are currently dependent on this type of assistance, anything that we can do as a responsible government to help them acquire skills necessary to obtain a job or to advance to a higher paying job will be money well spent. And therefore, Madam Speaker, the acceptance of this motion will begin a process where the government will begin to consider the affordability of the motion as brought by the fifth elected member for Georgetown. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Recognize the Honorable Minister responsible for education.
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to wholeheartedly support this motion, which was brought by the fifth elected member for the District of Georgetown. Madam Speaker, as the member stated in his closing remarks on this motion when he introduced it, this was something that the independent members of government campaigned very heavily on, and it is actually reflected in the National Priorities Plan 2013, the introduction and the implementation of the immigration accreditation system. So, Madam Speaker, I, as I said privately to the member, I'll say publicly, I absolutely think that this is not only necessary but timely, given that all the government is attempting to do with respect to investing in our human capital development, our employment initiatives, and therefore the attempt to bring down the incidence of unemployment amongst our people. Madam Speaker, this motion and what the motion calls for would help to provide meaningful opportunities for training and promotions of Caymanians in the workplace. And it recognizes the rewards and rewards employers who are, quote unquote, good corporate citizens that do their part. Madam Speaker, no matter how many resources the government attempts to put towards policing the system. And yes, there are many who would argue that not enough is done with respect to the enforcement of our laws. This program would help to create a self-policing regime. Madam Speaker, it puts the honest, it puts the responsibility on the employer to prove compliance with the laws in order to be given the higher accreditation and thus to be given the higher preference, so to speak, that goes along with being considered a higher tier accredited company. So, Madam Speaker, it shifts the burden of the issue of enforcement and compliance to the employer. And therefore, we would expect that the increased levels of compliance would also be increased. Now, Madam Speaker, I don't want it to be understood or to be assume that the government does not have still a responsibility with respect to enforcing the laws in which we as legislators make. That is why we have the various civil service departments, the various government departments, and we expect that those agencies would carry out their mandates with respect to enforcing the laws. But Madam Speaker, much has been talked about the carrot and the stick approach, but I think it's important for us to recognize that, and as was alluded to by the fourth elected member for Bordentown when he gave his contributions, the issue of employment and labor relations in this regard, we have a very interesting system in that, Madam Speaker, although I have in my title Ministry of Employment, the aspect with respect to regulating the gainful occupation of non caymanians falls within the immigration law administered by the immigration department. And so this accreditation system, Madam Speaker, would help to create the synergies, would help to create the culture of compliance which this government is trying to achieve by putting the various mechanisms in place. Madam Speaker, I'm happy to say that as a result of this government taking office last year, we have seen some significant improvements with respect to the cooperation and the workings of the Department of Labor and Pensions and the Immigration Department and the National Workforce Development Agencies. There have been mechanisms that have been put in place that are still being tested, still being tweaked, but we have come a long way, Madam Speaker, to the right hand knowing what the left hand is doing. But Madam Speaker, as I said, this system will help to move us even further because it no longer just creates the government agencies chasing companies for compliance. Companies themselves would be clamoring to show that they are in compliance in order to get the higher accredited 
scores and therefore to be seen and to be given the rewards that come as a result. The member from the fifth elected member from Georgetown talked briefly about issues of proof of compliance with the national pensions law, compliance with the labor law, in-house training programs, which this accreditation system calls for, employee and external scholarships for Caymanians. And Madam Speaker, as the minister responsible for administering and, and the, the scholarship regime, which is something, Madam Speaker, that the government invests very heavily in, over $10 million, and if you consider what is the remnants of the Nation Building Scholarship Fund, approximately $13 million of this government's money is spent towards scholarships every year, and Madam Speaker, we still have more applicants who qualify than we can actually fund. So Madam Speaker, the honest, the responsibility of companies stepping forward and giving scholarships, and we know we have many good corporate citizens in that respect, Madam Speaker, and I want to recognize publicly those companies that do what they say that they do in their business plan and that they offer scholarships. But Madam Speaker, there are a large number of companies who are actually required to give external scholarships, but there is no mechanism in place which really actually tracks to see how many of those companies actually deliver on what they're expected to do. So Madam Speaker, this system will help those companies to actually be in compliance with what they're required to do and want to get recognition for that through the actual accreditation. So it is a win-win on, on many fronts, Madam Speaker. We're actually able to supplement the pool of funds so more of our students, more of our people can get the scholarships which the government simply cannot afford to fund, albeit we have probably one of the most generous scholarship programs in the world, companies would then be able to participate and get recognition for that as well. And Madam Speaker, another very important aspect of this accreditation system and the criteria in order to be considered uh, an accredited company is participation in local educational programs. And Madam Speaker, you've heard me speak on a number of occasions in this House and also in the media about creating the public-private partnerships in education. And Madam Speaker, it is absolutely vital that this country accepts and embraces the need to have private sector participation in helping to provide the necessary resources from a financial, from a human capital, from, a, from, a, from a supporting the actual development of certain programs. Because simply put, Madam Speaker, the government alone cannot provide all things to all students, to all schools. We have, as I said, a very large budget, but Madam Speaker, we have more needs than we have resources. And the more that we continue to dedicate to education, which Madam Speaker, as the Minister of Finance stated several days ago, education is one of the key priorities of this government and we will continue to invest in it. The fact is there are still more needs than we can provide without the participation of the community. And so this system will help to create the impetus for other companies who may not be actively participating. We do have some very notable organizations both private sector as well as um, non-governmental organizations, organizations such as CISPA, supporting our numeracy program. We've got LIFE, Literacy is for Everyone, supporting our literacy program, and there are a number of other organizations, Rotary, with regards to literacy, and uh, a number of them that I'm not able to li list off in totality today. But, Madam Speaker, we have a whole lot, a whole other cadre of businesses who could be, who should be participating, and this program, Madam Speaker, will help to provide the impetus that many of them will need in order to get actively involved. Madam Speaker, it also deals with employment practices, and as I said, given that our employment regime straddles a number of ministries and a number of laws, it is important that we have a system that actually looks and causes companies to look very closely at what is considered fair and equitable pay practices. 
Now, Madam Speaker, as I said earlier today in my response to the minimum wage question, the government is also looking at ways to legislate that uh, through the work of the Minimum Wage Advisory Committee, and we look forward to getting the report. But, Madam Speaker, this will also act as an impetus for those persons to decide what should be paid above and beyond what is determined to be the minimum wage. And again, Madam Speaker, those types of considerations would be given favorable treatment under the immigration accreditation system. It looks at companies determining and looking to promote the number of Caymanians as employees, number of Caymanians in management, health and safety practices, and other employment-related concerns, which, Madam Speaker, it is more effective if we have companies themselves coming to the table and actually putting forward these suggestions, which this system did when it was initially developed and which we expect will continue because a number of companies were ready to hit go on implementing this. However, it never did come to fruition. And as I said, Madam Speaker, this is not only an important motion, it is a timely and necessary because this government has a number of initiatives which we have started, which we are promoting, which we are hoping to continue to implement. But the mere fact is we all know for various reasons we have to live within the means, so to speak, that we are given at least for the next several years, and therefore the participation of private sector in order to make this a reality is absolutely vital. Madam Speaker, I also endorse wholeheartedly the second resolution of this motion, which is the creation of a segregated training fund of 10% work permit fees to be paid into that. Madam Speaker, I'd like to briefly discuss some of the training initiatives and development initiatives which has been taken by this government primarily through the work of the National Workforce Development Agency. Madam Speaker, over the past year, the Ministry has explored a range of options and opportunities to address the needs of training and development of Caymanians, seeking to access and seeking to progress in the labour market. Now, Madam Speaker, while some of these initiatives that have been developed are built on low-cost models, again, primarily with the understanding that we have to be financially sustainable and live within our means, other initiatives, Madam Speaker, that the government would like to roll out will require a source of funding. And Madam Speaker, as it stands at this time currently, the NWDA is not a revenue generating entity. And so it is imperative that as the agency seeks to develop its training and development initiatives, that there is some mechanism that's put in place to facilitate the funding needed to sustain and to enhance those initiatives. And Madam Speaker, through the development and training unit of the NWDA, there are three distinct areas of training which is being offered currently. There is a soft skills training, there are the technical skills training, and the employment search skills. And Madam Speaker, these workshops, these training programs are delivered primarily through a collaborative partnership between the NWDA and private sector volunteers. Madam Speaker, the volunteer basis of the model, on the one hand, allows us access to professionals and specialists in the private and public sector. It promotes sustainability from a purely financial perspective, given that there are minimal costs associated with delivering the training currently. It also helps to ensure that what is delivered is relevant as the workshops are developed and designed in partnership with employers currently. However, Madam Speaker, basing a training and development program primarily on volunteers has its drawbacks. Namely, 
It is subject to the availability. It is subject to the commitment of the volunteers who sign up to deliver these programs. And I need to understand that whereas we have very a number of committed volunteers who on a weekly basis will participate and will deliver these training programs through the NWDA, there have been instances, Madam Speaker, where training sessions have been set up, participants registered with NWDA have shown up, and the volunteer instructors have not. And so that creates a difficulty in trying to have sustained uh, training program that is really at the, the, the mercy, so to speak, of volunteers. Things happen, you know, people may have other priorities, but at the same time, I do want to thank publicly all of those companies, all of those individuals who have volunteered their time thus far. Madam Speaker, another initiative which I spoke about yesterday, or Friday, dealt with the National Internship Program. Again, another program which has been developed, Madam Speaker, as a pilot and which we're looking to roll out. And it was, we, were, we took a, a low cost model as well, because the fact is we want to get our young people, we want to get our students, we want to get our persons who are looking for the technical and vocational experience in the door. And so we asked companies to take these individuals on it for the most part for either a three to six month period and as it stands currently in an unpaid position. But Madam Speaker, we know that if we want to extend and expand this program to offer a more robust program, there will be financial implications for both the participants with respect to being able to participate and still live and possibly the companies or the government themselves. And so this fund would be actually very beneficial because that could help to offset the cost of the stipends paid to these interns and therefore we're able to roll out the internship in a more meaningful way. Madam Speaker, another initiative which the government is very keen to get started, but I have been told, quite frankly, we have no money to do so this year, is the National Apprenticeship Program. And Madam Speaker, you would have heard mention of this program on a number of instances today, but just to let you know that the Ministry has already begun work at developing a framework for this program. We have engaged in discussions with the Chamber of Commerce earlier this year and other private sector partners to ensure that the program is developed in collaboration with the private sector who we would be relying on to actually participate and deliver the vocational training aspect or the experience, experiential aspect. Now, Madam Speaker, I'm still waiting to hear from the Chamber of Commerce with their response um, and providing me with the proposal which they said that they would do and I'm really hoping that that response will come shortly because we are ready to move on that and in the meantime we're continuing to have discussions with other industry representatives in order to try to achieve a targeted market driven training opportunities for Caymanians who are engaged in studies both locally as well as abroad who will be returning to Cayman shortly and who are interested in gaining the requisite technical skills and practical experience in order to access the labour market. Madam Speaker, during the 2013-2014 budget year, the NWDA Training and Development Unit engaged in an analysis of the immigration work permit data with a view to identifying the technical and vocational employment opportunities within the labour market as measured by the number of work permits. This data, Madam Speaker, will be used in this current budget year to engage, to continue to engage the targeted private sector partners in the development of a community-based technical and vocational programs that matches the needs of the labour market. Madam Speaker, this community-based technical and vocational program will be the model used for the National Apprenticeship Program. 
And as I said, initial dialogues has begun with the Chamber of Commerce, and we're also continuing to have dialogues with other associations, such as the Cayman Contractors Association, in order to take this program forward with respect to the construction industry. And Madam Speaker, this has already been successfully launched through that of the School of Hospitality Studies, and we look to do something similar for other key industries in our community. Madam Speaker, the community-based model aims to ensure that all stakeholders commit to doing their part to preserve the economic and social health of our country. And again, this community-based model, as opposed to a purpose-built technical or vocational school, which you often hear the cries for, this actually utilizes existing businesses and their physical structures, to which in itself facilitates fiscal responsibility. The community-based model facilitates a flexible program that can respond to the needs of the labor market as and when they exist and as and when they change. So in other words, when the market reaches a saturation point with respect to any particular program, that program can shut down until such time their needs for those skills again. And Madam Speaker, in order to ensure that the programs develop meet a quality assurance standards, a number of accrediting bodies, both regionally and in North America, will be engaged to provide ample options for accreditation of the local training programs. Madam Speaker, the Ministry will be working with various industry associations and companies to help to determine the appropriate technical and other courses and an accrediting options which are acceptable and recognized by the respective industries. Because, Madam Speaker, that is something that we recognize is key. It is critical that we develop programs that the market, that the private sector, and public sector will accept. There is no point investing money on training and development of our people if those qualifications are not recognized locally in the market. And so with respect to these technical, vocational, professional tra training and development opportunities, this government is very keen to engage private sector to ensure that they will buy the product once the product has been delivered satisfactorily. And so, Madam Speaker, in support of the community-based model, in the delivery of the technical and vocational programs, the Ministry of Employment, Education and Gender Affairs will be establishing standards and quality assurance framework for training institutions, which includes the development of a mechanism to register local training institutions through the Education Council. This facilitates opportunities for businesses to create training centers within their business while ensuring that quality control standards are in place. And Madam Speaker, this accreditation system speaks very heavily to those companies being rewarded for investing in training and development of our people. So this very much ties in with the goal and the strategy of this government with respect to facilitating the environment for properly accredited training programs. Madam Speaker, the government has set forth an agenda that seeks to ensure that educational opportunities meet the needs of the market. In doing so, the Ministry has engaged in discussion with the Board of Governors of UCCI and I made to understand the Board of Governors of UCCI has established a subcommittee which is looking at opportunities whereby the UCCI can assist in offering technical and vocational programs that meet the needs of the labor market. Again, the outcome of this review will help to ensure that the National Apprenticeship Program is established and it will support, it will be supported by formal education opportunities at UCCI which are actually accepted by the business community. Madam Speaker, under this community-based model, it is envisaged that the formal educational component of the program will be supported through scholarships awarded to students based on established criteria. Once the students are engaged in the internship or placement component of the apprenticeship program, they will be placed with a local business. It is expected that the local business will provide either a stipend to the student for the duration of the program. And again, Madam Speaker, 
now with the advent of this fund, this, the cost for the scholarship program, for this for scholarship aspect of the program can be offset or help to be offset by this training and development fund which this motion calls for. This model allows for the sharing of the financial responsibility and ultimately produces suitably qualified Caymanians. Madam Speaker, the investment made by employers will be returned to them through the pool of qualified local talent available. And again, Madam Speaker, this is recognized as a part of the immigration accreditation system. Madam Speaker, by moving to fund individual students as opposed to funding programs, it allows for the government to have a better mechanism of bonding students. It allows them, it allows the government to the ability to track students' progress through the respective programs and into the employment and labor market. And Madam Speaker, as was mentioned earlier in his submission in the fifth, ele fifth elected member from Georgetown mentioned, the government is doing all that we can to try to create an environment where our people are given real meaningful opportunities for training and development. But it is now up to individuals to take advantage of those opportunities and to take seriously those opportunities. And we expect that people will actually fulfill their obligation with respect to participating and completing. And in the instance where they don't, this mechanism will allow us to be able to determine who has not lived up to that obligation. And therefore, there could be a formal system of bonding uh, put in place. And Madam Speaker, this is an example of how the funds from the 10% contribution could be utilized to support the retooling and skills development of our people, a concrete example. So Madam Speaker, I am very much looking forward to the government accepting this motion and acting on this motion so we're able to actually create a pool of funds which do not exist currently so we can actually move forward on some of these initiatives which we've been talking about for since we took office. Madam Speaker, utilizing the portion of this fund as a workforce income supplement will also provide us with the ability to provide unemployed persons with an incentive to engage in related activities to increasing employability, which again will facilitate their ability to get and retain meaningful employment. Developing this formal structure that ties financial support back to measurable activities ensures that persons who are receiving funds are engaged in activities designed to change their current employment status. Because as we heard already as well, you can't do what you've always did and expect to get different results. And so if we continue to give the man the fish without teaching him how to hold a line, and fending for themselves, then we will continue to create and to promote a culture of dependency as opposed to a culture of empowerment and self-sufficiency. And so, Madam Speaker, this incentive provides a vehicle for reinforcing a healthy, positive, and constructive behaviors amongst some of the persons who are unemployed and who are currently receiving assistance from Children and Family Services. And now, Madam Speaker, I don't want it to be misunderstood or misconstrued or misquoted. Let me speak very clearly. We know that there are a number of persons who require assistance from Children and Family Services. Those persons should absolutely have access to, and in many cases, their assistance should actually be increased. But because the system that we have now does not promote to the extent that it could or it should, this quote unquote welfare to work ethos, the persons that need the assistance can't get it, and persons who are getting assistance really shouldn't be getting it. So Madam Speaker, we need to create an environment where we assist those persons who are able-bodied, 
but for given the real opportunities, they should be in employment. And by creating a mechanism that incentivizes companies to actually actively seek persons for employment, persons who could be able to be upskilled and trained given the opportunity, those persons would then be able to have and make a meaningful contribution. Because, Madam Speaker, many people, I see they in my constituency office on a weekly basis as well, many people have come to me in tears almost with a pained expression of having to go to children and family services because either what they're making is not making ends meet or they're not gainfully employed for the amount of time for the week that they should be. They're underemployed or they're outright unemployed. And so they're having to do something that they never thought they would have to do. And Madam Speaker, we know that in many instances, these individuals want to work. They want to be given the opportunities. And Madam Speaker, by putting in place this system which, as I said, actively encourages companies to actually do what is required under the immigration law, which is to take best efforts to find suitably qualified Caymanians, and in the instances where they are not qualified, to create real opportunities for people to get qualified, we will see, hopefully, a shrinkage of that population of persons receiving assistance. And Madam Speaker, in order to support this move towards the Welfare to Work program, the NWDA has developed a structured intake and assessment process, which includes the identification of barriers to employment and the appraisal of skills, interests, and abilities of the clients who register. Madam Speaker, through this process, job seekers are connected to training and development activities and mechanisms of support which are designed to facilitate the job seeker in overcoming any barriers to employment. Once these barriers have been identified, job seekers are engaged in a process of creating a professional development plan. And Madam Speaker, this is something that is new, that has just been introduced by this government, in that job seekers no longer can just register. If you register and you are seeking assistance from the National Workforce Development Agency, you are now obligated to create tailor-made professional development plan based on the assessment of your skills and interests. And this plan documents specific details of the activities that the job seeker has committed to engaging in as they address these barriers that they have to having them gain meaningful employment. And they must engage in the work necessary to meet the needs of the current labor market. These include training opportunities, volunteer work, community service, therapeutic services, mental health treatment, substance abuse treatment, and the like. So Madam Speaker, job seeking clients are being held accountable to their own professional development plan. And that is something that is important to stress because not only is the government saying that we are wanting to hold employers accountable which this, in, in this accreditation system will help to do, and employers will willingly do so in order to reap the benefits. But we are also making sure that we put mechanisms in place to hold job seekers accountable as well. And so, Madam Speaker, I am happy to say that the professional development interface has been created and this interface, which actually works with several different government agencies, again, pulling all of these resources and trying to operate as one government when we're tackling the issue of unemployment, will go a long way to help us facilitate an online case management of clients who are seeking services from multiple government agencies. And so if an NWDA job seeking client is also accessing the service of other, another government agency, this interface allows the various agencies to provide feedback on the job seeker's progress and the various activities they have committed to engaging in to ensure that the work necessary, that they work and they do what is necessary to get them one step closer to entering and 
performing in the job market. So Madam Speaker, this mechanism as designed and developed by the National Workforce Development Agency can be used to provide the structure needed to ensure that the proposed workforce income supplement is successful. And Madam Speaker, utilizing this fund will also incentivize businesses who may wish to hire and train Caymanians, especially small or growing businesses, Madam Speaker, who require a certain level of technical expertise at the onset, those businesses may then be in incentivized to take on and train as a part of their growing business, Caymanians at a low cost, which is commercially viable and sustainable. So, Madam Speaker, it provides an opportunity that may not currently exist because those small businesses may not necessarily be able to afford to hire on a trainee, but either through the income supplement provided by this fund or the scholarship or sponsorship of the fund, these businesses, businesses will be more inclined to put their hand up to participate in the internship and apprenticeship programs which the government is hoping to roll out. Madam Speaker, we are experiencing something in this country that I don't think we've really experienced in our history. And that is, we have a number of graduates who are coming back to Cayman or graduating from institutions in Cayman and are not getting hired. They're not just not getting hired, but they're not getting hired in a timely manner. We've heard stories of people one, two, sometimes three years out and still not able to get employment. And what is being held over them, initially it was, you didn't have the education. So we went off to get educated, or we went to school to get educated, or we participated in the training opportunities to get skilled. Now what is being used, Madam Speaker, is you don't have the experience. And Madam Speaker, one of the programs which the government is considering, but again, was not in a position to fund, was to have a graduate development program, Madam Speaker, which is similar but a targeted aspect of the National Apprenticeship Scheme whereby we know every year we have over 100 graduates from university, either locally or returning from overseas. One of the programs that this fund and the Immigration Accreditation Scheme would support would be that public and private sector could take on a number of these graduates for six months, 12 months, 18 months, however long the, the, the industry requires for them to become technically competent. It allows these graduates to get some practical experience in their field of, of, of study, as well as it allows them to participate in additional formal training to be agreed with the NWD and the prospective employers. And Madam Speaker, it also helps to develop the relationships and the networking opportunities that are so vital for our students to have because we have a number of students who now not only go on to do their first degree but they go on to do masters and PhD who may not necessarily have the practical real life experience because of their quest and pursuit of education being told you need to get the education in order to access the jobs. So Madam Speaker, this program with the support of the funding that this training fund would offer would help to fill a serious gap and a void that exists right now for a number of our returning graduates who are not finding the opportunities in the labor market because of the lack of experience that is being used as the barrier for them to gain employment. Madam Speaker, The, fifth, the fourth elected member from Bowdoin Town made, in his contribution, a comment with respect to whether or not immigration is the appropriate place to deal with labor and labor relations in this regard. 
Madam Speaker, that's a debate in and of itself. But the fact is, the immigration law is where, from the employment aspect, as it relates to the management of foreign labor, that is where we look to. And Madam Speaker, I think it's important for the listening public and members in this chamber as well, possibly, to get an understanding of what the legislative framework is right now as it relates to employment and that of the work permit. Madam Speaker, I recall being asked on a local talk show a couple of months back now, what was the employment policy governing the hiring of Caymanians, and I stated very clearly that that policy was enshrined in immigration law. However, I don't believe that the talk show hosts actually understood that point. Um, but I will reiterate for the listening public as well. If you look at Section 4 of the Immigration Regulations 2013, it clearly states that an employer or prospective employer shall use his best endeavors to ascertain whether or not there is a Caymanian, a person legally and ordinarily resident in the islands, ready, willing, and able to undertake the job in question before making an application for the grant or renewal of a work permit in respect of a worker or prospective worker whose gainful occupation in the job is sought to be authorized by the work permit. So, Madam Speaker, in other words, the employment policy that the government has as I said, it, you could argue it's in the quote-unquote wrong law, but this is the policy. An employer must take best endeavors to ascertain whether or not there is a Caymanian, an other category of worker, who are ready, willing, and able to undertake the job in question before making an application. So, Madam Speaker, also, in looking at Regulations 4.3, the regulations calls for, for the purpose of fulfilling that first regulation, the employer or prospective employer shall comply with subsection or section 44.2b of the immigration law. And Madam Speaker, turning to 44.2b, it simply states, in relation to the prospective employer that he has, unless he has been exempted by the governor or by the board, sought by advertising in at least two issues of the two consecutive weeks in a local newspaper to ascertain the availability of any one or more of the following in order for which they're listed. So Madam Speaker, that regulation calls for simply the advertising in two issues in two consecutive weeks. And Madam Speaker, I have to say that in my estimation, that requirement is woefully deficient. Because Madam Speaker, we have an immigration department, as we heard from the Deputy Governor, who has lots of information on employees. They have lots of information with respect to persons who are on work permit. So, Madam Speaker, I submit here today that we need to have a system where the Immigration Department publishes on an open and transparent database when each permit has been granted, the type of job associated with the permit, and when the permit is up for renewal. Now, Madam Speaker, this information can be published on a no-names basis, so I'm not here advocating for people's personal information, but I am advocating for having a transparent database so people will know exactly what jobs are coming available when. The purpose, Madam Speaker, of the investment in the National Workforce Development Agency database to provide a link, which has been accomplished in one year, which many people thought wasn't going to happen, and I know that there are still technical issues which are being worked on as we speak, but Madam Speaker, the NWDA database provides that information to the Immigration Department about which Caymanians 
which other persons legal and ordinarily resident are registered who are presenting themselves as being available to do certain jobs. But Madam Speaker, we need to go one step further. We need to know when these jobs are available, when they're coming up, because Madam Speaker, if we look again at the immigration law, under section five, each per of the regulation, sorry, each permit shall have an endorsement or be accompanied by a notice to the per work permit holder in the following terms. You are hereby informed that under the existing laws and regulations, the granting of this work permit in no way confers any entitlement to or preference in connection with the granting of any application for the renewal hereof or of any application for the right to be Caymanian. So Madam Speaker, it is clearly enshrined in our laws and it is clearly enshrined on the work permit itself that the granting of the work permit does not in and of itself give you any entitlement or preference in connection with the granting of the, of the application for renewal hereof. Madam Speaker, so it's important that for students, again, students that are coming back, students that are trying to access the market, professionals who maybe have made redundant or professionals who would be looking to change positions even for career progression and career advancement, it is important that we have a system that captures when these jobs are actually coming to market and the reliance on two consecutive weeks in the newspaper is not sufficient notice for people to plan to access, to even develop the skills that may be needed. Because these applications are supposed to, or these ads are supposed to outline what the skills are to do those jobs. It is about helping our people plan and prepare for the right type of skill set and the right skills development programs and so we need to have this transparent information, Madam Speaker, in order to, to make a meaningful dent in the issue of unemployment. Madam Speaker, the immigration regulations go on to speak about the board or the chief immigration officer may require an applicant for the grant or renewal of a work permit to provide details of any program that he has that is designed to ensure that Caymanians are provided with the instructions and practical experience necessary to make them fully qualified to carry out the job concern satisfactorily and as expeditiously as possible. It goes on to state that the absence of such a program or the failure to implement such a program without reasonable cause constitutes a ground for denying the grant or renewal of the work permit. So Madam Speaker, the immigration regulations already speak to the requirement for training. And as many of the persons speaking earlier today recognize, is that there is an issue with respect to the actual enforcement of these regulations in many instances. This system, Madam Speaker, will help to shift the burden to the employers themselves to demonstrate that they are actually doing just that, providing meaningful opportunities for practical experience and instructions in a way which supports the training and development of Caymanians. And so, Madam Speaker, by accepting this motion, we will help to create an environment where these provisions are actually operationalized, but also, Madam Speaker, what the government has been doing with respect to developing the framework, developing the resources, developing the programs offered through the NWDA, through the development of the database, and hopefully by immigration, developing a similar database with respect to work permit applications we will have a mechanism which operationalizes these sections of the regulations which have been made over 10 years ago. So Madam Speaker, in support 
of the adoption of the accreditation system. I think it is not only necessary, but timely. And I agree with the mover and the movers in their call for the implementation of this system within a six month time frame. I believe the, the system is in place. It is just a matter of the government making this a priority and moving this forward. And I look forward to being a part of that government that does that. And Madam S Speaker, I also support the creating of the segregated training fund. Because Madam Speaker, as we heard, we are spending over $9 million on DCFS. A lot of that money can be diverted towards this training fund through, as was discussed in my presentation and a number of presentations earlier, for those persons, Madam Speaker, who should be actively seeking work, who should be getting gainfully employed. And the fund will help to transition and the creation of the upskilling and the income supplementation for those persons who are willing to undergo the necessary training to secure employment. And as we heard, Madam Speaker, we are not reinventing the wheel. We would not be reinventing the wheel by accepting this motion. Singapore, who is in many ways a competitor to the Cayman Islands as a financial center, they have managed to successfully implement such a regime and they have managed to develop a highly skilled workforce. It is us as a government having the political will and the participation of the private sector to see this thing through fruition. So Madam Speaker, in my mind, this is a win-win situation. It is a win for all. The government will help to move the employment agenda forward in such a way which we will ensure our sustainable development of our country and our people and employers who demonstrate that they're doing their part, and many of them already are, Madam Speaker, so their ability to be accredited at the top tier will, will be little, little or nothing. It's the other employers that we need to encourage, the other employers who are not compliant with their pensions or health insurance. It's the other employers who compete on importing cheap labor and not providing proper training, proper health and safety, etc. It's those employers that would be most negatively affected initially. But Madam Speaker, this should hopefully bring them in line with what we want from all of our employers in the country. We have to upskill our people, Madam Speaker. We've heard that time and time again. We have to also find the funding in order to promote this program. And so, Madam Speaker, suffice it to say, the fifth elected member from Georgetown and the fourth elected member from Bordentown has my wholehearted or have my wholehearted support in this motion, and I thank them for bringing it. Does another member wish to speak? Recognize the Honorable Premier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I believe I am the, I am the last man, last person. I would say the last man standing, but <laughs> the, la the last person, in the last member of this House to speak with respect to this important motion. I think, Madam Speaker, that all of those who have spoken before me have Pledge their support to the motion. And I believe it is time that we renew this initiative which was begun under the previous PPM administration, but seems to have languished over the course of the last five years. Madam Speaker, I have said in this House and elsewhere before that I do not believe that continuing to whip the horse, or to use the whip, I should say, uh, that we've used over the last 40 plus years is actually going to result in much more than, than what we, we see now. That it is far, far more likely that we will get a change in attitude of, of employers generally 
if they believe that there is something in it for them and for their businesses if they if they give greater opportunity uh, to Caymanians, if they provide more training, if they do the things which really and, and quite frankly as good corporate citizens they ought to do in the first place. But this system which is proposed would actually provide a series of rewards for those corporate citizens who do the right thing and those that don't would obviously not receive those benefits. So, Madam Speaker, the government wholeheartedly supports this motion. And I just want Madam Speaker to, to say a few words in re with, with respect to the whole immigration system, work permit system, employment system in Cayman. Madam Speaker, anyone listening to this debate would have heard the frustration in the voices and in the expressions of many members of this House, um, indeed resentment in some cases about the way that, that Caymanians have been treated, are treated in the workforce in terms of, of employment opportunities and, and upward mobility or the lack thereof in many instances. Madam Speaker, none, none of that is new. All of that has been around, I think, ever since uh, we started having foreign labor come to the island, and a certain amount of that is inevitable and, and is to be acknowledged and, and accepted, if, if I may say that. But, Madam Speaker, as, as others have alluded to, in, in down times such as we've had in the course of the last five years, although things are are certainly on the economic front looking much brighter now than they were even a year ago, there is still you know, some significant lag in terms of, of um, employment opportunities for Caymanians. And it's not just the marginally employable, if I may call them that, the casual labor and so forth. As the Minister of Education and Employment spoke to just now, you know, we have increasingly significant numbers of persons who, who actually come back with second and sometimes third degrees who are finding it very difficult to find a place in the, in, the, in the workplace. Madam Speaker, that is the stuff, that is the stuff that is most worrying of all. Because when persons feel that they have done everything that they possibly can and can't find an employment opportunity in their own country, that breeds a level of resentment that, that does not augur well for the, for the social um, balance and, and, and peace for which Cayman, places like Cayman ha have been known for many, many years. And Madam Speaker, the, you know, I, I can't, although I said I would, never, I would never do this, I can't help but comment on, on the lack of sensitivity, really, of some in the media, Madam Speaker, when, when they, they speak to these issues. But I, I don't want to get into a, a back and forth between myself and, and the Cayman Compass and their editorial board and so forth. But I'm going to say this much, Madam Speaker. I know full well, as does every member of this government, and indeed most people in the country, that the Cayman Compass does not support the current administration. Quite who they are backing is anybody's guess. But, but I'll say this. It is one thing to have an opinion. It's another thing to base that opinion on, on factually incorrect um, statements and premises and positions which increasingly, um, and with distressing regularity, they do. They commented in the, in the, comp in the editorial today about the, the policy that has been adopted by this government with respect to immigration couldn't be further from the truth. And if one just examines the facts of what we've done in, in immigration, on the immigration front since we took office, it, it will become apparent to anyone. Which administration was it that dealt with the temporary um, limited term permits, the TLEPs, extended uh, permits, this administration. Which administration was it that extended the rollover period from seven years to nine years in the face of a great deal of opposition from, from Caymanian quarters? It was this administration. Here we are now pressing forward with, with another progressive proposal, accreditation, rather than relying on the old, worn out, and, and we, we believe ineffective means of of taking businesses to task through the law because they haven't
fulfilled what their legal obligations are. But Madam Speaker, I just have one word of advice for, for those who, who, who write these editorials and take these positions. You will never ever discern what the attitude and the sentiment and the basis for, for feelings of local people by simply circulating in the cocktail circuit. You've got to live in the real Cayman and move among our people. And then you won't express surprise about the, this growing feeling of us and them, which you, you, you write about in your editorial column. Madam Speaker, pr pretending it doesn't exist is not going to make it go away. And when they talk about preaching divisiveness, the divisiveness that I see and I feel is generally not in this house. I see it more and more in the editorial column of, 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 of places like the Caymanian Compass. Madam Speaker, this country has been built has been built because over the years we have managed to understand even when there's resentment and, and hard feelings on either side that the relationship between Caymanians and those who come here to work and invest is a symbiotic relationship. It requires both of us. But please don't come to my country and to tell me or to tell the people of this country that it it's better to do it this way because that's how they did it where you come from. It amazes me all the time that, that people who have left where they came from because they, they see a better prospect somewhere else will seek immediately to import, to import and, and impose upon that other place all of the, the things and systems and attitudes that they, that they left because they didn't think it was working well. Madam Speaker, this is not a xenophobic government because I expect that's going to be the next headline I'm going to see. This is a government that is striving in, in difficult circumstances and with little support from most media to return the Cayman Islands to the path of prosperity where there is a government that has credibility, where people who live and work and invest here can have confidence. But Madam Speaker, it must be understood that these three little rocks do not exist for the principal purpose of enriching those who come here. This was not some blank canvas that people who came here in the last 30 and 40 years and painted. These islands have been inhabited for more than 300 years through some really, really rough times. We are a hard, tough, enterprising, self-reliant people. That's where we came from. And Madam Speaker, it is insulting, quite frankly, sometimes to, to, to read some of the things that are said about Caymanians and Caymanian attitudes. Sometimes they say, Jesus, Lord, even a stop clock is right twice a day. The government can't be wrong with everything it does. There must be one Caymanian, at least one, who is capable of something. Why is it that page after page, editorial after editorial, is hammering away at some Caymanian institution, hammering away at some Caymanian attitude, principle, precept. Everything, everything in this place is bad. Why do they stay here? The, 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 the negativity is overwhelming, Madam Speaker. And while I get frustrated by it, I hold that most of the time, but I know because I move and live among our people, that the, the, the way I feel about what is said is not just Alden McLaughlin's views. You know, 
I'm going to really get in trouble now. But Madam Speaker, when you, when you look, you stand back and you look and you see who it is, who it is that is expressing these views. Ask yourself how many of them even begin to understand what makes Cayman, what it is to have to struggle to, to make a living. How many of them understand what it is that elected members of this house deal with every single day of our lives? <laughs> Madam Speaker, they, they say, and the editorial says, a rising tide lifts all boats. But Madam Speaker, it can't lift those boats that are tied down by, by all sorts of economic forces. Madam Speaker, I, like you, struggle and strove to make something of our lives. You know, often I say to myself, I, I, peop, some people look at me and say, oh, Arlen's got it made. Madam Speaker, I've been working since I was 16 years old. Nobody gave me a scholarship to go to law school. Nobody paid my way. I worked my way through law school. I worked through the last three years of high school because my parents didn't have the means to send me off and I didn't get a scholarship. I've never complained about it. It's made me a stronger person. But I understand what it is to have to struggle and to work hard. All my adult life, hard work has been my best friend. Hard work and determination is why I beat plenty of them who plenty smarter than me. But it not many, and not many around that are prepared to do any more work than I'm prepared to do, even at this point in my life. But Madam Speaker, I know all about attitudes to, to Caymanians in the workforce. I know all about it. I battled some of those two. I was fortunate to be in a law firm that gave me an opportunity and within five years of my qualifying, even though they made me pay all my way through law school and I got paid not very much while I was there, within five years of qualifying I made partner. But no one can tell me about the attitudes to, to Caymanians in the workforce. Some of those attitudes have good basis. There's, there are Caymanians, without a doubt, who don't work hard enough, who don't have the discipline they need, don't have the work ethic that they need. I'm not trying to say no to, to that. But I am telling you that all of that aside, there is still, in many quarters, and they are good corporate citizens, and they are good firms, a certain resistance to giving Caymanians opportunity for, for social, for, for mobility, for upward mobility. That's the word I'm looking for. Madam Speaker, and I hate to use personal examples, but my, this is recent, this is the last few years. My wife went to law school late in life. <clears throat> but she did extremely well. She did better than I did. She got a high upper second, almost a first class pass in her degree. She got a commendation in her PPC. But it took her nearly two years to get articles. Madam Speaker, I got another horse in this race. My elder son got a high upper second degree in philosophy in Bristol. He just finished his graduate diploma in law. He got a commendation. He just went back. He's doing the legal practitioner's course, I think it's called, LPC. So in a year's time, when he's looking for articles, what are his prospects? With 600 lawyers here, 
any Caymanian who does well. Now, if I'm not saying they should hire persons who don't, who don't work hard and, and do well enough, there should be no Caymanian who has done well enough, who does not have an opportunity to qualify. So, so, Madam Speaker, we need balance. There are those who, 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 on the other side, who believe that every foreigner ought to be run off the island and that we can do it all by ourselves and, and that we need to make the, the work permit provisions tougher and all of that. Madam Speaker, that is not my view. That is not the view of the government. As I said at the start, this is a symbiotic relationship. But it must be right, and it would take a higher force to tell me otherwise, it must be right that a Caymanian who strives, who wishes to work, who does the necessary to get the qualifications and the training, that they ought not to be offered the job in preference to someone who is not Caymanian. If anyone can convince me that there's something wrong with that, then all that I have thought about over the course of the last almost 40 years now is all wrong. If you can't get preference, having done all of those things in your own country, where should you get preference? I know of no country in the world that operates on any different principle. And so, Madam Speaker, we are not, coming back to the motion, we are not going down the road of whipping employers about this. What we are proposing is a scheme by which good corporate citizens get, get rewarded for doing the right thing. And by one means or another, because we'll have, we'll have to make adjustments elsewhere, el elsewhere in the budget, once this scheme comes into effect, 10% of the work permit fees will be placed in a segregated fund to assist with the training part component of the overall access of the uh, which is carved out and which is set out in the motion because madam speaker none of us on this side and I, I those who spoke before me said so but I'll say it again none of us on this side believe that to be Caymanian is a qualification enough the persons in our workforce, in most instances, have to operate in accordance with global standards. Because Cayman is a service-based, is a jurisdiction with service-based industries. Everything we do is service-based. So the standard of service that we provide, regardless of whether it's in the hotels, regardless of whether it's in the financial services industry, has got to be global standards. And we can't expect our people simply because they came here not to have to operate in accordance with those standards. But, Madam Speaker, when we do, we must be given the opportunity. There are attitudes among Caymanians that need some adjustment. I'll get some licks for saying that too, but it is true. I often wonder, Madam Speaker, and I, because I pay attention to these things, as I move around, there are so many jobs I see being done by non caymanians which our people could do. And you wonder why they won't do them. In some cases, maybe it is, they think the wages are too low. Well, Madam Speaker, my attitude to that, and I've told some of them that who have gotten angry with me in my constituency office. I remember one, one young lady in particular that I called up a supermarket and I said, they must have something you, you can do. I called up my friend, I won't go into names, at one of the supermarkets and I said, you have any jobs that so-and-so can do this? She has this, she has that, she has the next thing. And he said, yeah, I have, I have a couple of cashier jobs. How much do they pay? 
So when I said what, when, I, when he told me what it was to pay, and I said so to her, she said, I can't work for that. I said, but you're not working now. Something is better than nothing. It's easier to get a job when you have one. So we, we have to get away as a people from that attitude. If you are not working at all, and in this case had not worked for eight or nine months, and you're having to get assistance from DCFS or from whoever you can get it from, surely $6 an hour is better than nothing. So Madam Speaker, I, I say all of this just in case any of those who are listening to me and will report on this think that I have some misplaced view that, that, that Caymanians you know, are all perfect and, and all Caymanians should be given jobs regardless. That's not my point at all, Madam Speaker. But, but, the, but the perspective, the other perspective, which I, I see and feel and hear, you know, is also based in, in a fantasy world. A world in which, which indicates to me that those who write those sorts of things really have no clue about what is really what is really alive in, in the minds and feelings of the average Caymanian. And Madam Speaker, if you live in the rarefied air of the cocktail circuit, you can certainly come to that view. But Madam Speaker, we who work in here don't have that luxury. And we are here in the first place because what we have said and how we have lived and how we have conducted ourselves resonates with the people who vote for us. And Madam Speaker, this is my fourth term. And every single term I've been here, when the election came, there were people who were here that are not here the next time round. Because that set of people out there who vote for you, pay attention, they listen, they know when, when you are addressing their concerns and needs, and they know when you are not. And I promise you, if you do not if you do not, or if they do not believe that you are addressing their concerns and their needs, you won't be here next time round. And I know I don't need to say that to you, Madam Speaker, because you've been here longer than me. You understand that very well. And Madam Speaker, I, I, just, I just wish to finish with something I say all the time, is that politics is the art of the possible. We all have ideal views about a whole range of things. And given, given that things were, were ideal, this is precisely what we would do, and we would fix it. But politics is not the world of the ideal. We've got to operate within, within the, the social conditions and the circumstances in which we find ourselves. One thing this government is not lacking is vision. But Madam Speaker, it is vision tempered by the reality of the circumstances, including, including the economic conditions and the financial position of the government. We are keenly conscious of the need to continue our work in, in getting the economy moving again. There, it is moving, but moving faster. Of course we agree that more job creation is what we need. Because the more jobs there are, the more opportunities there are for everyone. But surely, Madam Speaker, you cannot be saying to us that in the meantime, we ought not to insist that the jobs that there are, if there are Caymanians who are willing and able to do those jobs, that they shouldn't have those jobs, but that we should import more people to do those jobs and leave those Caymanians displaced, which is what the editorial is, is suggesting. Madam Speaker, that sort of approach is a recipe for social disaster. 
the feelings and, and the very strong feelings, those who listen to the talk shows, those who move around and listen to people chatting in the supermarkets, in the bars, in the restaurants, the local people, will know what I say to be the truth. Is that when Caymanians look and believe that there are foreigners in jobs which they can do, there's bound to be huge resentment. There's bound to be this feeling of they're getting all of it and we're not getting anything. And if we as a government <laughs> choose to ignore that sentiment, I'm afraid, Madam Speaker, we won't be the government for very long. But then again, that may well be what those in certain quarters are hoping for. And that they can return to a time where policy can be set at the editorial table. My view, Madam Speaker, is if you want to set policy, you need to get elected. You know, those of us who are here have the privilege to set policy because we have run the gauntlet and we have been chosen. Everything is but for a time. And I know, and I know full well, Madam Speaker, that I may never have another term. That's the way it is. But this I know, Madam Speaker, while I'm here, while I enjoy the confidence of my people and my government, I am going to endeavor to do that which is right. I am not perfect. No one in my government is. I have made mistakes. Lord knows I'll probably make some more. But of this, everyone in this country can be certain. I care deeply about this place and my people. I am the seventh generation on my father's side to walk this land. There are some who claim to love Cayman, and perhaps they do. They say Cayman is a place that they want to live in. Madam Speaker, Cayman is the place I want to die in. And here, my bones interred, along with those of the generations who have gone before me. My only legacy, I hope, is they say, they say he was an honest man who tried his best for his people and he loved his country and his people dearly. I want no other legacy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Does another member wish to speak? Does another member wish to speak? Last call, if no one wishes to speak. I'll call on the mover to exercise his right of reply. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I will be brief. Madam Speaker, I am extremely grateful for the overwhelming support that I received when putting this motion forward. But with this group of politicians who have Cayman's interest at heart, I can't say that I'm surprised. I'd expect nothing less. Madam Speaker, there were a number of our colleagues who didn't get up to speak, but saw me outside the chamber and who wholeheartedly supported the motion. So for those in the chamber and those who have left, I want to publicly thank them because every single person that was here today has given their support. Madam Speaker, we now have a task in front of us and I've set a six month deadline. So I promise that I will work tirelessly to ensure that we implement this over that period with the help of my colleagues in government, I know that we can and will get this done. Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank you again for your indulgence. To the fourth elected member from Bordentown, I thank you for supporting me in this motion. And to all the members in this honorable house, I say thank you.
Good night, Madam Speaker. The question is that be it therefore resolved that the government consider a review and, if necessary, a revision of the Immigration Law 2013 revision and the draft immigration accreditation system with a view to implement in short order and no later than in six months the methodology set out in the draft immigration accreditation system documents. Be it therefore also resolved that the government considers appointing a task force to consider any relevant revisions to the immigration law subsequent to the draft IAS documents, such task force to carry out public consultation and input from related stakeholders and present their revised draft to the immigration accreditation system, which will be included in an amendment to the immigration law and brought into effect. Be it therefore also resolved that the government consider as part of the immigration accreditation system the Singapore model whereby for each skilled worker imported, 10% of the work permit fee currently paid for such work permit holder to be paid into a segregated fund by the Immigration Department. The fund should be used solely for the training and upskilling of locals in order to teach skills and retool workers in order to allow unskilled locals to enter into and succeed in the skilled labor market that they are currently not able to access. Such fund can also act as a workforce income supplement to replace social services for those able to work and actively looking for work and willing to undergo such training in order to incentivize employers by supplementing salaries of local training for employment. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those against, no. The ayes have it. Accordingly, motion 6 of 2014, 2015 is duly passed. Honorable Premier, can I have a motion for the adjournment, please? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, my, my great hope and expectation, expectations with Dash, we got four motions left to go. So I'll have to adjourn this Honorable House until 10 a.m. on Wednesday morning. The question is, is that this Honourable House do not be adjourned until 10 a.m. Wednesday morning. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Those against, no. The ayes have it. The House now stands adjourned until 10 a.m. Wednesday morning. <laughs>